Hello and welcome to 18 Hour Startup Central India's only daily show dedicated to entrepreneurship, innovation, technology, basically everything to do with the new economy. I'm Rahul Daima coming to you from uh, India Startup Hub Bengaluru. Like always, we do have a power pack show lined up uh, over the next one hour. Uh, remember to pitch uh, to us on suc at etnow.tv. Startups watching this who want to be on the show uh, as a viewer, what is it that you want to uh, want us to cover? Tell us, uh, and we will have that uh, done. Moving on to the top story on Startup Central today, uh, we have finally seen the first startup to list uh, on the BSC Startup SME platform, uh, AlphaLogic Texas, a Pune based uh, uh, boutique software consulting firm has really uh, applied for an IPO. They plan to raise close to 6 uh, crore uh, from this. Uh, uh, this is a long haul really for startups that have been looking for a conducive platform and uh, BSC sort of came out with a special platform for these startups to really list. I believe we do have uh, the managing director Anshu Goel of Alpha Logic Texas joining us from uh, uh, Pune to take this conversation forward live and exclusive on Startup Central. Anshu, uh, congratulations on the plans, uh, really uh, welcome to ET Now Startup Central. Uh, was it easy? First thing that entrepreneurs watching this, I definitely want to know, was the entire process easy for you to really list uh, on uh, the BSC startup platform? Uh, hi, uh, and thank you so much for inviting us uh, to present uh, Alpha Logic. Uh, so uh, to answer your question, I don't think so that uh, the, answer, uh, the answer to your question is not really yes. Um, but uh, I think uh, when you have a good team around, uh, when you have a good lead uh, lead manager, when you have uh, people who uh, who are really willing to help you out, I think the process becomes easier. But it's not that easy from compliance wise, and the process has been uh, like exorbitant. Well, uh, definitely congratulations on the fact that uh, you sort of went through, although, you know, you sort of you had to defer it by a few days due to a technical problem. But what were really the challenges? Uh, Anshu, could you elaborate, uh, share your experience for, you know, entrepreneurs, startups watching this? Uh, uh, this is the first one really and uh, your uh, experience and learnings will definitely help entrepreneurs watching this. And uh, I think let, let me put it this way. I think this is a wonderful platform for startups to raise funds. Uh, so, uh, uh, though obviously because uh, you are re you are reaching out to the public uh, for for raising funds, there would be a lot of compliances. I think that is something that uh, deters the startups to take this route. Uh, but I think so. This is one of the one of the uh, most uh, fruitful ways the government has enabled uh, uh, this platform. And I, I would like to salute them for doing this, making it easier for companies like ours to kind of uh, think about an IPO, which is a dream come true for any any company, any entrepreneur, right? They want the entrepreneur. So basically, you start a business uh, to see your company mature to an IPO, right? Having said that, uh, I think uh, the process uh, is a bit cumbersome, but I think it is like a, a eight to ten month long process where you need to have a really good merchant banker who would be able to help you out, understand the nitty gritties, the laws, uh, different. Uh, so there are basically you have to follow, comply with SEBI's rules, the exchange rules, uh, the register of companies, MCA rules. Right. So you need to have a really solid consultant who could help you guide through this process. Uh, having said that, uh, I think uh, in order for a company to uh, think, think, think about an IPO. Think about an IPO. I think they need to have a strong team, um, uh, some mature processes, so that and and, a, and an established business, a profit-making business, to reach out to the market for for, for funds. All right. Of course, you know, having a profitable business is definitely one of those criteria. But let's talk about, you know, Alpha Logic uh, itself uh, in terms of the business. You know, you're sort of fulfilling digital transformation needs. You have high profile uh, clients across the globe. Uh, um, uh, you know, what's happening on the business front? How lucrative is this? Uh, uh, because you also deal with startups, right, as your customers, uh, really? Well, Alpha Logic basically is a boutique consulting firm. And uh, we work in new age technologies. Uh, so uh, these days, uh, uh, the, uh, the, the term used is kind of uh, digital technologies, 
right so we help our clients go digital in terms of their products in terms of in terms of their business processes so we help uh, our clients automate their business processes so i think we have two important segments that we work in the first being uh, software as a service so we have expertise in developing uh, large scale uh, software as a service applications saas applications for our clients that is one expertise that we have second expertise is in the healthcare domain uh, so we are we have a good team we have got uh, uh, like about uh, a long experience working in the healthcare sector for us healthcare data so and th- that has been a deep expertise we have been doing some work in the artif- uh, in artificial intelligence for these clients uh, working on large databases uh, like like huge data like it's it's a big data basically so it's a big data project that we have been working on uh, having said that uh, i think uh, it services business has really been uh, the flagship uh, sector uh, like of our country right uh, so uh, india is known for its software it's, it's known for its software services i think uh, for moving forward uh, we'll see a lot of product companies coming out of india and uh, the opportunity is huge right so the we we are still a small firm but we have been growing at a healthy rate of about 40% in the last 4 years um, so i think the opportunity is huge and we see uh, similar growth rates being maintained this is what we are trying for we are, this is what we are striving for all right and um uh, anshu really allow me to uh, come in there uh, 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 what was as an entrepreneur the biggest trigger for you to stay away from uh, a vc uh, money uh, really uh, was that a conscious decision i was reading somewhere uh, you know where you sort of mentioned that you did not want to dilute it too much uh, of your control over the startup as well uh, uh, what really was the trigger for you to uh, take this long haul route of an ipo uh, and not go through investors really okay uh so this 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 is a critical question i think you are putting me in a soup here by asking this question but i'll try and answer that so uh, while i do not want to criticize of any any mode of investment but this is my personal view and i think uh, in the peer group uh, founders keep on saying that uh, when vcs bring in the money uh, they 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 strive for control they want to dr- uh, drive the strategy of the business so i think uh, for an entrepreneur it is very important that he is in the driving seat right so uh, that is something that that was kind of a turn off uh, uh, for me as an entrepreneur and uh, i think uh, ipo was more suitable from that perspective while while raising funds and being in the driving seat that is what uh, that is the best thing that could happen to any company so i think that is why we took this ipo route All right, um, Anshu, you sort of uh, dodged it uh, a little bit, but last, lastly, before I let you go, what has uh, been your biggest learning uh, in the entire process as an entrepreneur? This is really a dream, a dream come true, right? Uh, uh, an IPO, an IPO on Indian exchanges, uh, and uh, the role that BSC, the government, sort of played to ease the entire norms for someone like you to go out there and have your say on the exchanges. okay so i think uh, the journey has been fantastic a lot of learnings during this uh, about a year long process uh, and i think there has been a really good support from the bombay stock exchange uh, in terms of helping uh, kind of telling what the advantages are what the flip sides are what the ro- laws say the merchant banker uh, finsure management has made it easier for us to understand different compliances different processes uh, so i think so uh, in, as far as learnings are concerned i think uh, one you have to uh, have to be prepared to face the eventual eventuality right so uh, uh, you have to look for uh, uh, the right uh, uh, right merchant banker you have to look for the market conditions you have to be prepared you have to go out and put in the word for yourself be prepared on telling about your talking about your business which a lot of entrepreneurs generally lack um, in our country right Uh, so they do uh, like there are a lot of entrepreneurs they do fantastic work but they are not good in marketing themselves and i think i am one of them uh, but i think uh, uh, this 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 uh, bias or or this shortcoming one has to come over uh, i think you have to go all out there talk about your company there would be a lot of people who would be willing to help you and support you and i think this is what we, we are wishing for and i i would like to add one more thing here one beautiful thing about the startup exchanges it allows you to list your company without any net worth requirement uh, if you are registered with the uh, as a startup with the government of india though we are not registered as a startup with india we had certain net worth requirements but this is a beautiful thing that is one second you get an opportunity after two year cooling off period to move to the main exchange 
and uh, that is something we are looking forward to. All right, um, Anshu, you know, we, you've taken the path less taken. We wish you all the best uh, uh, for the IPO and see how it fares. Uh, really, thank you so much for taking out the time and uh, joining us. Uh, thank, thank moving on, so yes, much. continuing uh, the discussion on the topic, India's first uh, uh, startup uh, IPO, that is, uh, 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 the larger question is, has startups emerged uh, as uh, an asset class for investors, angel investors, and now uh, uh, really retail investors who sort of look to buy into India's startup story. We are uh, being joined by Rehan Yar Khan, the managing partner at uh, Orias Venture Partners, uh, to take this conversation forward. We will also have Mithul Mehta from Constellation Blue joining us in a while. Uh, uh, Rehan, coming to you first, uh, you know, uh, we've debated this so, so long. Uh, uh, why are startups not looking at uh, the BSE platform uh, uh, really uh, for an IPO, that's happened now. Your first take, uh, a startup really listing on the BSE's uh, SME startup uh, platform. <clears throat> yeah, I think it's uh, uh, it's encouraging and, and, and uh, I certainly think that uh, it'll be exciting for investors, uh, public market investors who have not been able to participate in the startup story so far. Uh, and I think we got an indication from that from uh, uh, India Mart's IPO, which was 36 times oversubscribed when it hit the stock market, because there's such a dearth of uh, startup paper in uh, in the stock exchanges, especially in of tech startups, that uh, there is a tremendous amount of appetite. Uh, so I think it's a fabulous thing that uh, startups have started um, availing of this platform, uh, and and I hope that continues. Um, it'll be, uh, and, and we saw that not just with this uh, uh, startup that, uh, uh, that, that we've just spoken about, but also with uh, uh, what happened, like I said, with India Mart. And, and also if you look at some of the other startups which listed a long time ago, um, that uh, you know, they've done well on the, on, on the stock exchanges. So I think, um, yeah, you know, uh, Rahul, given uh, about a year or two, let's say late 21, early 22, we should be seeing uh, a lot of startups which are yet private starting to go public because if you think about it, the Indian startup story is about eight, nine years old and it typically takes around anywhere between eight and 12 years for a startup to start going public. Uh, uh, so, so I think it's very interesting, very exciting times. Certainly investors on the private side have done extremely well. Uh, there have been 35 uh, unicorns which have been created in India in the last nine years. Uh, generating over $65 billion of value, almost all of it private. Uh, and, and some of the exits which have happened have also been while they have yet been private, like uh, Flipkart got sold or, um, uh, you know, Ritesh has done that big buyback uh, in Oyo. Uh, so uh, the, the, the riches have all been in the private sector and it'll be very, I think, exciting for public investors once it comes to the, to the listed space. Uh, Rihan, I, I, what's, I, I want to discuss you know do you see startups now emerging as a new asset class uh, with people buying into that story you're right we've seen the flipkart exit we've seen uh, uh, you know the exit that a lot of venture capitalists have got uh, angel investors also a uh, lot of deals have sort of uh, made a lot of moolah but do you see indians really lapping up to this uh, also because uh, it is an uncertain business right the focus is on growth not so much on profitability there's a 8 10 year horizon and even as we talk you're right there are a lot of startups that are are going to uh, sort of take the IPO route in the next coming years? Yeah, uh, uh, Raul, it's, it's, um, I, think, I think it will be, you know, in the beginning, like all these things start, it will be extremely marginal. There will be a few sophisticated investors that, uh, uh, you know, that are attracted to these companies uh, and, they, uh, and they invest in them. And then over the years, we'll see that this, uh, this pool will grow. Uh, so it's not just uh, uh, retail investors, right? It's also institutions that uh, need to be attracted to this business model. Uh, however, I believe that uh, when once startups uh, hit the stock market, they would have got their house in order and, you know, they would be focused a lot on the usual uh, cash flow and profitability metrics that uh, investors of those markets are used to. Uh, I don't think we're going to see American style uh, uh, IPOs anytime soon where unprofitable companies are, are IPOing on the Indian stock exchanges. I think that is going to be a tough sell uh, for, for some time. And I think Indian startups, which are uh, unprofitable, uh, if they want to IPO, they're probably going to go to the US 
to the US stock market where investors have appetite uh, for you know those kind of risky assets um, uh, so so I think I think once they hit the IPO market it will be no different from a regular uh, like you know some other company of course in a different uh, in a different vertical uh, with a different theme uh, so I think you should see at that point a lot of uh, participation you know to, to your question of has this thing gone mainstream no by by no by no accounts is uh, investing in startups a mainstream activity in India it is an extremely tiny small group of people a uh, few thousand people in India which are angel investors and 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 you know who participate in funds in India few institutions participate in India uh, uh, and as as uh, people might know 99% uh, of the funding that has come into Indian startups uh, in 2019 in 2018 in 2017 has all been from overseas sources so Indian participation both institutional and uh, retail is extremely limited in in the startup space Uh, uh, yeah, Rehan, I wanted to hold your thoughts there. We do have Mithul Mehta also joining us uh, to take this conversation forward. Uh, Mithul, you know, we were discussing uh, with Rehan as well the fact that uh, it's very nascent, really, a uh, few angel investors uh, uh, sort of betting big on the uh, startup story. And we have uh, the first IPO really on the BSC uh, startup SME platform. Your take, do you, uh, of course, uh, too nascent right now, but in the coming years with a lot more startups really saying that they are looking at an IPO route, uh, Rehan did uh, sort of make a valid point that uh, a lot of them would prefer the US market to list, but the smaller companies would still find it lucrative uh, uh, solving India specific problems uh, to convince investors that there is value in there. Uh, yes, yes, absolutely. So, you know, I, I, I think uh, India as a country has tremendous. Uh, opportunity for any startup, uh, you know, it has the uh, population and, you know, while people say population is a disadvantage, I think a lot of uh, what the startup activity revolves around today is because of the population that we have, right? Solving any unstructured problem and converting it to a structured problem uh, is what startups are essentially doing today uh, in spaces like agriculture, transport. Uh, so definitely that story is uh, one that can still sell very well. And uh, I'm, I'm hoping that uh, this industry does pick up significantly. Yes, it is extremely small at this point in time, but uh, the success stories that we've seen in the last three, four years, uh, you know, like you mentioned, the IPO, India Mart IPO, there's been an E2E Networks IPO. Uh, there have been a couple of successful acquisitions. Uh, investors have got their money back. So, you know, people who uh, are looking at a long-term horizon, who have patient capital that can sit for about eight to 10 years uh, or more maybe at times, then uh, this is definitely a space that will grow, but it will take some time for sure. All right, um, uh, Rehan, you know, of course, we're discussing the broader implications of this. Uh, uh, but uh, as you rightly mentioned, a lot of money that startups are raising is really from the VC community. This is an ex exception, so to say. So we will in the coming years also see um, uh, the funding really driven by large, uh, uh, you know, venture capitalists, institutional investors. Uh, 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 really, that is a trend that will very solidly continue over the next few years as well. Yeah, I don't see any reason why that should uh, slow down. Uh, in fact, all the data is pointing to uh, it increasing, and and Raul rightly so because um, uh, you know there is more and more uh, uh, distribution and, and and consumption of these products every year. So um, uh, uh, you know, let's look at this data point of unicorns. We have 35 unicorns in India. Nine of them have been minted this year alone. We'll probably end up closing the year at 13 to 15 unicorns, uh, and and this is half of what it was last year. So as uh, uh, and and a unicorn means that a company is of a certain size, right? Uh, so uh, so this kind of value creation, this kind of need for money uh, to grow, is attracting venture capital. Venture capital is a finance product, as you know. It, it it's money, uh, it's money against shares. Uh, but it's money to the startup and, and then money is fuel uh, to, to grow the business, right? And as the market has become larger, you know, since Geo's launch, for example, at the end of 2015, four years into that, we have seen a lot of growth in, uh, in uh, tier two, tier three and rural markets of India uh, of, uh, uh, of mobile phones. And along with that have come, has come content, along with that has come payments, along with that has come e-commerce. 
Now, all these verticals require money in order to grow uh, because they're all businesses. Uh, so the need for venture capital uh, will continue because that is the preferred sort of finance product of startups. They're, they're not uh, very interested in private equity. They're not very interested in debt. Um, uh, they probably can't do debt because uh, they're not profitable. Uh, so, so they will continue tapping into venture capital pools. And venture capitalists from all over the world will keep coming to this market because there is so much demand for venture capital over here and positive outcomes are being produced. Um, uh, you know, large exits have happened last year, this year, uh, IPOs are likely to start uh, significantly from next year and the year after that. Um, so I think, I think we are in a virtuous uh, positive cycle that will, that will keep, keep increasing. And of course, we're seeing a lot of uh, startups go global as well from here. So, uh, you know, the ask by investors and the interest will continue. Mithil, lastly, before I let both of you go, let us give credit to the government as well, right? So much has changed over the last two years and sort of uh, easing the norms. SEBI has been working on it. The BSC has been working on it. Uh, while this may not really be the perfect, uh, uh, you know, platform for now, we did see uh, Anshu Goel, the managing director of uh, Alpha Logic, also indicate that it was quite a task to list uh, but we are on it and things will get better from here on uh, yes absolutely you know even even i mean look at the steps that they've been taking the uh, activity that niti ayog uh, you know involvement of sidbi in in venture capital funds you know these are definitely positive steps uh, there is a startup ecosystem that is being heard today uh, it is well known uh, you know that there are some problems and we're raising them and they're being heard uh, it you know, there is mention in budget speech, like I mentioned last time as well. So it, it, it is at least there on the mindset of the government. And uh, there is some effort that they are putting in at their end is, is my, uh, you know, feeling. Uh, the only thing is that, you know, a lot of this effort is not translating into ease of business yet for startups and investors. I think if we, if we can clear that hurdle, you know, there's a long way to go and definitely, you know, greener paths ahead. All right, on that note, Rihan and Mithul, thank you so much for taking out the time and uh, joining us. We will closely watch out that IPO fares, really, but uh, quite a rise with India story there. Uh, on that note, we will slip into a short commercial break on Startup Central. A lot more coming up. We continue to put the focus uh, on our uh, campaign, the Green Warriors, uh, solving uh, problems in the area of waste management. Stay tuned. We have a conversation coming up with Saha Zero Waste on the other side. Welcome to ET Now Startup Central. As promised, uh, we continue to have a power pack show uh, lined up. Uh, now putting the focus uh, on our Mission Green uh, campaign. Remember, the Prime Minister had made a clarion call for startups uh, to look for innovation in the area of waste management, uh, uh, the single-use plastic uh, uh, really. And we have decided to put the spotlight on Green Warriors, startups really solving the problem in the space. And uh, joining me today on this special segment is uh, Wilma Rodriguez, the founder and CEO of uh, Sahas Zero Waste. Uh, Wilma, thank you so much for taking on the time and joining us. Uh, uh, what do you personally make of uh, Prime Minister Modi's uh, call to entrepreneurs like you? Of course, you have been uh, in the space for many years now from an uh, NGO to a for-profit startup. You also recently closed a small round of funding from Impact uh, Investors yourself. Uh, well, it's very welcome to have, um, you know, single-use plastic or in the scanner and actually now attempts at a you know national level to um, to kind of reduce it drastically this is something that has been happening um, over the last few years but now with you know uh, government attention across the country uh, it is a very welcome step and uh, we hope now that you know it will go um, into a really serious implementation where uh, state governments urban local bodies will all work together along with the generators and the producers to kind of reduce this kind of single use one time use plastic talk to us about sahas zero waste itself uh, you know you've sort of built an interesting end to end model you work with corporates uh, large residential complexes uh, and uh, uh, 
uh, the uh, the problem you're solving is not only effective management of uh, the waste but also the entire recycling bit right that you're ensuring to ensure that uh, you solve the problem from end to end yeah that's right so uh, saha zero waste actually we evolved from an ngo so totally we have about 18 years of experience in the space of waste management and you know there is a big uh, difference between waste disposal and waste management. Uh, today you have regulations which the first set of regulations came out in 2000 where you work with waste so that it can get converted into resources um, and therefore you know you have a zero waste kind of system where very little waste needs to go to a landfill. So we, we transitioned from an NGO to a private limited in 2013 specifically because we realized that the problem of waste was, was mounting, was growing and a business model as in a social enterprise was what we believed uh, would best address the kind of uh, situations, the kind of solutions that were required and also help people uh, actually comply with the regulations. So yes, today we work with uh, large companies, corporate campuses, tech parks in Bangalore, Chennai, uh, South India basically to help them convert, you know, 90% plus of their waste into resources and thereby, uh, you know, make sure that very little waste needs to go to a landfill. And our business model, uh, we are a startup, uh, our business model is revenues from waste and revenues from a service fee. Because we must understand that actually almost 70% of our waste, which is low grade plastic, um, you know, really low grade paper waste, there is very little economic value to it. And this is the waste that we see typically otherwise on our streets. But for our customers and people whom we work with, we are able to actually manage all kinds of waste through a system of collection, aggregation, um, uh, and then transport to recyclers. So therefore, the service fee component is a very important part of our business model. Wilma, allow me to come in there. You know, you're saying that waste is also sort of uh, generating revenues uh, uh, for your startup. Uh, how has that worked? You know, you've created a model uh, where you sort of recycle products. Uh, um, are there takers for this? Does it go back to corporates? Uh, uh, really, how have you built uh, this business model? At the end of the day, it's interesting you made that switch from a not-for-profit to a startup, right? Yes. So, um, as I said, uh, we must understand that, you know, whilst you may have revenues from waste, because when you sell waste, it goes to a recycler and there is a, a transaction in terms of uh, revenues that the recycler pays to organizations like us. But there is a significant operations in order to retrieve this waste. So, there is a, a big operational cost around transport, around, uh, you know, paying people uh, for that recovery process. So net net, you really cannot run a, a, a sustainable business model managing all types of waste, including, you know, low grade, say paper cups or plastic uh, waste. Therefore, the service fee is an important part of, you know, a business model when you are offering um, end to end services like the way we do. So when I say end to end, uh, we actually today manage about 50 tons of waste per day for about 60 customers in Bangalore, Chennai, Hyderabad and now to an extent also in Goa. So our business model is where we work with the customer right from you know day one where we put in place a segregation of waste at source, engage with them, uh, put in place infrastructure for collection of segregated waste and then this waste comes to a central point as wet waste which then gets digested through either biogas systems or composting and then the dry waste goes through a multiple secondary sorting exercise and you know 21 different categories are then recovered and each category has to go to a different recycler. So you may have a waste stream like PET bottles for instance which brings you better revenues versus say paper cups or plastic cups or even you know low grade packaging like your toothpaste kind of covers. Now that 
uh, revenue which when you sell to the recycler does not meet your entire cost of operations. So if you want to be like us a holistic complete end to end waste management company you will need to have um, you know a service fee so that the people who work with us and we have a team uh, which is 300 strong and you know we make sure that the team whilst there is a strong uh, you know base of the pyramid people working with waste at the uh, you know at uh, at the back end there is also a team at the front end uh, who is professional highly qualified and and this team is also necessary to make sure that you know we have uh, a good data system in place we have a good tracking mechanism we have a good uh, engagement this, process uh, all of this is taken uh, care completely uh, at the uh, out front of time uh, really on the show before i let you go uh, it would be great if you could share two or three tips for viewers watching this uh, uh, really on how can uh, they also we live uh, 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 you know well uh, managed waste uh, uh, managed uh, life really what would your tips be to people watching the show so i would say that see waste management is just beginning in india and there's a big opportunity uh, huge quantities of waste being generated in our cities also small towns but we need to address this problem holistically so whilst you had you know the informal sector and the kabadi walas and scrap dealers taking care of certain grades of waste carton boxes uh, shredded paper etc today when we are when we call ourselves a waste management company we've got to look at how we manage all kinds of waste including the wet waste including all kinds of low grade waste as well so therefore the business model that people need to consider is a service fee which really is something that uh, is affordable today today at tech parks and you know even large apartments can afford to pay that 300 or 400 rupees per household per month uh, it is really not very much and this will make all the difference to having a holistic waste management system All right, uh, uh, Wilma, uh, on that note, thank you so much for taking out uh, the time, um, the green warrior that are sharing the experience, building a startup and a uh, business model oriented one at that. Uh, uh, thank you for joining in. Moving on and continuing our focus on sustainability, on climate change, uh, Walmart Foundation today has announced a new grant, part of the larger commitment of $25 million uh, for India over the next few years, where they will work closely with smallholder farmers, uh, uh, helping them with access to the right market. Uh, um, also, the uh, agri tech technology part of it and to take this conversation forward we are joined by uh, Kathleen the EVP um, uh, chief sustainability officer at Walmart also the president of the Walmart foundation uh, thank you so much for taking out the time and joining us on the show Kathleen want to understand uh, you know from your experience here in India over the last few years what problems have you encountered uh, as far as uh, issues of uh, smallholder farmers are concerned and how different are they really compared to uh, you know, uh, farmer issues that you're seeing uh, panning out globally. Smallholder farmers in India face actually many of the same challenges uh, faced in other parts of the world. Uh, there are challenges around knowing which crops to plant, uh, of what quality, uh, what time of the year to be most relevant to markets and get the best price. There are challenges around the growing practices uh, not only the environmental uh, aspect, but uh, how to optimize the inputs, fertilizer and other inputs, uh, what kinds of seeds to plant and how much to pay for them and so on. So where to invest the cost to get the highest yield um, to fetch the best margins uh, at market. And of course, there are big challenges today that are really climate related. So we can take a look at some of the challenges around drought and dry farming. Uh, irrigation, you know, some technologies to irrigate are much more cost effective than others and, and then the weather ends up playing a big um, role in that as well. Typically there are significant challenges around infrastructure, so post-harvest storage, uh, how to get crops to market or how to get the, the um, products to market. Um, sometimes a lack of capabilities around value-added processing that could help enhance the margins for the crops 
And then um, often there are significant challenges around access to capital uh, to pay for some of these things and technologies, uh, so, so not able to access the right technologies. So the combination of these challenges can vary significantly from place to place, but those are some pretty common themes that we're seeing here in India and that we find in other places where we've been working, such as Mexico, Central American countries, uh, South Africa, and so on. You know, you mentioned about the role of technology. Uh, could you talk to us in detail about uh, uh, the role of innovation really in the entire sustainability effort? Uh, any India-specific learnings that you have seen and uh, you plan to sort of take to the global markets that you operate in? Technology holds so much promise to not only elevate farmer incomes, but also significantly enhance the sustainability of agriculture. It's one of the things that um, keeps me sleeping at night is, is the promise of technology and innovation and what it can bring to production. Uh, and just a couple of examples of how we're seeing that play out. So first of all, there are innovations um, around the relevance of technology. So drip irrigation systems that can be much more precise at providing exactly the amount of water that's needed to grow a crop, no more, no less, um, that, are, that can be much more cost effective than traditional systems or approaches to watering crops. That's really exciting because not only does it reduce the cost of growing and enhance yields, but it also prevents water runoff uh, and nutrient runoff and water pollution and also conserves water, which is so critical uh, in, in India um, these days. Uh, another example would be the use of digital technology to bring to the fingertips of farmers things that we couldn't have imagined bringing to farmers 10 years ago, whether that's instructional videos on how to optimize uh, crop yields like cashews. Um, one of our grantees, Digital Green, is using that kind of video technology to help farmers at every stage of the growing process with very practical, relatable tips about um, how to enhance their practices. Or you can imagine bringing together data about market pricing, weather, uh, things like that, that are useful not only for the farmers, but also for buyers to have more transparency into crops available, the pricing, the quantities, the specs, and so on. So uh, I'm really excited about the potential for technology to accelerate the farmer incomes and sustainability. Well, uh, the role of technology and innovation very crucial there. Uh, but Kathleen, I want you to comment on the fact that larger corporations are now under a lot more scrutiny as far as climate change, sustainability is concerned. What is Walmart really doing uh, uh, across the globe uh, at a store level also to ensure that you push these in initiatives as far as sustainability uh, and uh, minimal impact on the climate is concerned? Climate change is one of the biggest issues of our time, if not the issue, at least from an environmental perspective. So we became one of the first retailers globally to make a science-based commitment uh, to reduce our emissions. That means we've set some targets to reduce our emissions in line with the Paris Agreement, uh, working with the UN, with the World Resources Institute, and, and others to set those targets. That means we're working to reduce emissions not only in our own operations, so our stores like Best Price, Cash and Carry, our, our fleet and so on, uh, but also working with suppliers to reduce emissions significantly across our whole supply chain. So we made this commitment two years ago. To date, we have 1,100 suppliers signed up. And that's really one of the great um, advantages of a company like ours. We can leverage those relationships to engage other companies and get them to set higher aspirations. So through this program, we call it Project Gigaton because we have to reduce emissions by about a gigaton in the supply chain based on these targets. We are able to help suppliers set their own targets and do some very practical changes to things like energy in their factories, their agricultural production to reduce emissions uh, on field and, and improve carbon sequestration from agriculture, waste reduction, food waste and plastic waste, product design, change the way they design products, not only um, in the production of those products, but how they get used by the consumer to reduce emissions. So for example, cold water laundry detergent, um, and uh, customer engagement to help customers uh, change the way that they're using products to reduce emissions. Deforestation, so when it comes to sensitive commodities like palm oil sourcing uh, to change the practices 
to preserve our forests and, and have uh, better carbon sequestration. So these are very practical things that we can encourage and support our suppliers in doing to try to draw down emissions uh, worldwide across supply chains. Interesting insights there. Uh, Kathleen, thank you so much for taking out the time and joining us. Uh, on that note, we slip into a small commercial break. A uh, lot more coming up on the other side. Stay tuned. Startup Central. Uh, well, now to the exciting world of uh, e-mobility. Uh, Uber has finally relented to a long-standing demand by riders for a safety helpline uh, uh, number, really. They've gone ahead and launched it. Uh, 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 riders like you and me can now use the safety helpline to reach out uh, in case uh, of um, any conflict uh, with the driver uh, or to report any other issues uh, in non-emergency cases as well. My colleague Ashna Mishra caught up with Uber India's uh, uh, operations head, central operations head, for this quick chat. So, you know, Uber has a very deep uh, <clears throat> desire to constantly up the level of safety standards, not just on the platform, but in the rideshare industry. So today, what we are launching is a nationwide 24 by 7 uh, emergency helpline, a sa sorry, a safety helpline. And uh, the intention is uh, that if a rider feels that there is uh, any kind of discomfort on the ride, any urgent situation, which is a non-emergency, they are able to go to the help center mm. and contact us. Right. Uh, so, sir, I understand that this is not a replacement of from the emergency button which already exists. So, how is it different from that? And uh, can you just give us some instances uh, in which uh, cases uh, the customers could uh, call on that helpline number? Absolutely. So, the emergency button already exists and that calls the national emergency helpline which is 100 mm -hmm. and of course we also reach out to you after that just to make certain that you were able to get in touch. Uh, this button uh, is different, this feature is different. So if you have instances where your car broke down or you have a fair dispute with your driver partner uh, or you want to report a case of uh, rash driving uh, or drowsy driving, right? These are some of the examples or any other thing where you feel uncomfortable. It's an urgent situation as per you, but it is not an emergency. You can contact Uber through this mechanism. Right. Uh, sir, also we understand that a pilot of uh, this safety line was already launched in Chandigarh back in uh, March. So how has the response been uh, from Chandigarh? So the response from Chandigarh was very positive. Uh, once our riders knew about the feature, then they started using it and uh, based on their feedback in fact we continue to evolve uh, and you know tailor this and that's why we are going with a nationwide launch because it worked so well. Right. Uh, sir are there any other technological advancements that you are currently looking at or any other safety features that you will be bringing in the near future as you also might be aware that the Supreme Court had also recently asked the government mm -hmm. uh, to ensure that the ride hailing apps such as Uber uh, they ensure the safety especially when it comes to women so are any other uh, steps or measures that you are planning to come up with? So. Uber is constantly innovating, you know, as a leading technology company to enhance safety on the platform. So some exam th there are a lot of things that we are doing, which we'll continue to bring. Uh, some interesting ones that we have done is call anonymization. So the when you make a call, the driver doesn't see your number. And in the reverse direction, that's equally true, right? Another example is our real-time ID check, which is a selfie check. So periodically, drivers take their selfie. We match it in real time to their photo to ensure that it's the correct driver. And we also give you a notification before every trip that you should check the license plate, the make and model, and whether the driver in the vehicle is the same as the profile photo. So these are all technology innovations that we have done. And we'll continue to bring a lot more uh, you know, to the platform you know, in the months and years ahead. It's there with that new launch. Uh, moving on uh, to a story that will surprise and intrigue you. Restaurant in Bangalore uh, has really devised an innovative method to attract uh, more customers. Uh, well, they have moved to robots uh, to serve food to customers. Uh, yes, that's what a restaurant uh, in Bangalore is doing. Uh, how have they really done this? What does the restaurant look like? Well, I opt in to the robot restaurant in Bangalore to find out. In the age of online delivery apps, food is available on the click of a button. But traditional restaurants don't want to be left far behind. 
some are upping the tech game to stay relevant and stand out from the crowd. One player has turned to robots to get more footfalls. You must have been to a lot of restaurants, of course, but uh, one particular restaurant in Bengaluru wants to change the entire experience. A uh, uh, high-tech, technology-led restaurant, really, and the heart of this is really robots. Uh, um, plenty of them, in fact, really change the way people dine out. A team of robots have been programmed to serve diners. Dedicated pathways have been laid for them to move around effortlessly. The role of robots is to pick up food from the kitchen and deliver it to the right table. The robots have names and are interactive too. Motion sensors ensure they give way to people walking around. The management has however kept the process a tad too simple to ensure smooth operation. Well, so that's the robot really. They have about five of them to uh, ensure that they come down and really uh, deliver what you've ordered for. Um, it, it, it's, it's also communicative in a way that uh, it does have some voice commands really enabled but uh, a bulk of its duty really is to, uh, the, there are dedicated parts for us to come down and uh, pass the food uh, to customers. Um, even the online really, uh, the food that you order is through the tab so there's minimal human interface so to say it's an experiment they've tried uh, in Chennai as well and uh, Bangaloreans seem to be lapping up to this now. After coming here, we are really surprised actually. The way the restaurant is running, the way the robots are serving, it's a very, very innovative concept and we really liked it actually. It's very good. So apart from food, we only came for that thing to just to see how the robot is serving food for us. To be one of the first movers and trying out in Bangalore, yeah, it feels good. As long as it doesn't take my job, I am fine. <laughs> With success in Chennai and Coimbatore, the restaurant is planning to expand to more cities. From banks to retail stores, robots are emerging as an interesting alternate to effectively manage routine tasks. Don't be surprised if a robot greets you at a restaurant the next time around. Rahul Dayama, ET Now, Bangalore. Well, a candid customer there are saying uh, he wouldn't be bothered unless robots take away his uh, job. We hope you did enjoy this power-packed edition of Startup Central. Uh, remember to keep it with us every weekday between um, uh, uh, 6 and 7 p.m. And for all other business news and updates, keep it with ET Now.